Okay, uh, so this is my first time ever doing PowerPoint. Believe it or not, I'm like stuck in the 90, mid 90s with whiteboard, chalkboards maybe even. I don't know when, I don't know when uh, whiteboards became a thing. But uh, so PowerPoint combined with Zoom, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, probably a lot. So, uh, so let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to, to look at Casket Empty again and to think through some of these, uh, some of these issues as we look at the whole redemptive story of Scripture. And so our prayer this morning is that, uh, that you would keep us from the temptation simply to be puffed up and to get more knowledge in our heads. Uh, rather, we pray that we would be built up, that our hearts would be changed, that we would be encouraged to love you and know you more as a result of our study this morning. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so let's do a quick review. If you think you're ready for, for a review of Casket Empty and what uh, Eric and Lark have been been teaching all along. Uh, ready? The Bible is one redemptive story. Can I get a letter? Uh, through rhymes with mystery, history, yes. Through history, one redemptive story through history with close uh, with Jesus at its center. Okay. And we're going to see this over and over again today as we look at, as, as we look at the book of Acts and as the apostles um, in, interpret the book of Acts, inter rather interpret the Old Testament in the book of Acts. Um, particularly, they talk about the redemptive story as one that is anticipating the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, as the gospel moves from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, uh, what we see is the disciples are witnesses of, of Christ's resurrection, the fulfillment of the promises uh, to Israel in the Old Testament. And this is, this is similar to how Jesus on the road to Emmaus said that all of the scriptures are testifying to him, even testifying to his resurrection. So Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in, according with, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. So the resurrection is of first importance, and that's really clear as to how the apostles interpret the Old Testament in the book of Acts. In other words, the grave is empty. See what I did there? E-M-P-T-Y. The, that's our acronym for the New Testament portion. So now let's do a quiz on the acronym for empty. E is expectations. So this covers the intertestamental period, the time between the writing of Malachi and Matthew. This is around 400 years or so in which believers were, were waiting on the promises of the rhymes with Sheshaya. Uh, so E-M is Messiah. This is the description of life and ministry of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, approximately 6 B.C. through A.D. 33. And then what comes after that? E-M-P, Pentecost. Uh, it's part of what we'll, we'll actually cover the end part of, of Pentecost today. And this is just a shorthand way of saying, uh, hey, remember the beginning of of the global expansion of the gospel as the Holy Spirit is poured out uh, to the church of Pentecost and it extends Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Uh, Acts, uh, excuse me, 80, 33 through 65 is approximately the time frame of this. It's recorded in the book of Acts. Then E-M-P T oh, I shouldn't have gone to the slide. E-M-P-T, what's the T? Cheaters. Uh, so teaching, this re uh, represents the time in redemptive history when God commissions his people to teach the gospel to the nations. Uh, and that's the period covering the New Testament uh, other than Acts and before Revelation. So E-M-P-T-Y. 
<laughs> Thanks, Sean Luca, but no. Uh, yet to come. Uh, this is the section. What's this? Revelation. Uh, and of course, there's more in Revelation than just what is yet to come. There's also things in the past, and there's things that relate to the present. But um, also, there's there's things in the Gospels and th things in the epistles that point to what is yet to come. So it's not exclusive to Revelation, but uh, you, for, for purposes of memorization, this is sort of a, a broad eyeline. All right, so then let's review, if I remember correctly, let's review what happened last week or maybe the past couple weeks. Uh, remember at the beginning of Acts, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then... Jesus, what happens? What happens after that? It's kind of there. You can cheat. Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit upon the church. Uh, what happens after he pours out his Holy Spirit on the church? He goes, rhymes with messens. He ascends to the Father uh, and well, he sends the Father, and then he sends the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and <clears throat> what he promised begins to happen in the book of, of Acts. The gospel witnesses uh, go out, and they start in Jerusalem, and go to Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, but God has to sort of push them. Uh, in Acts 8, if I remember correctly, uh, persecution happens. And through the persecution, they begin somewhat unwilling to be, to, to be uh, spread out. They're forced out of their comfort zone out of Jerusalem into uh, what will begin to, to be the end of the earth. And then Eric uh, already covered the first and second missionary journeys the past two weeks. And the first one, you see there, Paul and Barnabas are sent from Antioch. You look there on your right-hand side. You can hopefully maybe see that a little bit. Uh, so the right-hand side, they're sent from Antioch to Cyprus on the island there. Then they sailed 150 miles or so across the Mediterranean to Perga. Then 100 miles or so on foot. I'm trying to see if you can see my clicker there. Yeah, oh, good, you can. Um, so 100 miles or so on foot to, to Antioch or Pisidian Antioch, then to Iconium, down in, in Lystra, and then... Uh, Derby, so they, you know, they'd, he'd been in the regions of Galatia, and then, you know, this was, notice, this was about two years' time, and I, I, I do think that's a big deal. I'll come, come to that later, but then there's the second missionary journey. Paul, this time Paul and Silas, in three years' time, uh, Paul and Silas are the ones, they're, they're extending the gospel because you remember, well, what happened? What happened with Paul and Barnabas? They had this sharp disagreement in which they, they split ways. So this time Paul and Silas are, are sent. Uh, these two are sent into what we now call Europe on the left-hand side there. Uh, then it was called the province of Macedonia. So it's areas like, like Philippi and Thessalonica, Athens in Greece, you remember Athens is where Paul speaks to the Areopagus, the, the, the Gentiles there, the pagans there, and uh, says, you know, the time has come. It was already here, but now the time has really come uh, in God's patience for everyone to believe, both Jew and Gentile, and to, to repent. And then uh, after that, he went to Corinth on the island there, middle left side of the map, and so on. He went to Ephesus for the first time, and then uh, he ends up back in Caesarea, where uh, you know Caesarea is back actually in Samaria, sort of kind of back to where he started. But uh, the the key takeaway here, I think, is simply the gospel is spreading, right? Uh, it's spreading to Greeks and Romans, all all these people from all these areas and Jews are believing too. It's, it's spreading across all cultures, all ethnicities. Uh, Jew and Gentile are more and more 
incorporated into God's church, into his covenant community. And we see that theme a lot in the book of Acts. This is all throughout the book of, book of Acts. That the gospel is for Jew and Gentile. And unfortunately, many of the Israelites didn't like that. Uh, after all, they think, you know, how could the gospel possibly include the Gentiles? How could, you know, wasn't uh, the promises of the Old Testament, weren't they given to ethnic Israel? Weren't they given uh, the covenants and, uh, and the law? How can the Gentiles be incorporated into that covenant? Essentially, the answer <clears throat> from the apostles and, and from Paul in particular is no. God has always wanted to incorporate it, uh, the, the Gentiles into the covenant community. Now it's just the disciples are preaching that this is, this is now more and more becoming a reality. This is more and more as the, as the Spirit is, uh, is being poured out uh, in the new covenant. The gospel keeps spreading toward the end of the earth. So then we come to the third missionary journey, and I'll get to, to this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so there ends our review. And here's where Paul had traveled now to, from Antioch to Galatia. He's strengthening the churches in the various places, many, many of the churches where he'd already visited uh, on his first and second journey. And the gospel goes forward, you see there, from Galatia to Ephesus. He'd already been to Ephesus on his first, or uh, rather on his second journey, I think. And he's got this long stay there in Ephesus. Uh, I'll get to that. Uh, but in the course of, of five years, 52 AD to 57 AD, uh, he goes to Philippi in Greece and back through Macedonia again, and Corinth again, a number of these other places that we saw in the, in the map. And you can see where this is reflected on the map there, just briefly uh, from Antioch over there in the middle right side to Galatia and Phrygia, and, and Ephesus. He's there for three years in Ephesus. Then uh, for the rest of that journey, it's, uh, it's almost two years. But, I, and, you know, he's, he's on his way to Corinth, and then he comes on, on back to, uh, to Jerusalem eventually. But this is, uh, this is, this is really significant. But I want to I come back to this, this three-year period in, in Ephesus. It's outlined in orange there because that's the best color, right? Go Gators. I should have done orange and purple. Go Tigers. Uh, anyway. Um, but notice there how strategic Ephesus was, even just geographically, right? They're right there in the middle of Asia Minor. They're on the water, right on the, the sea trade routes, and the major Roman roads that were coming to and from there. And so it, it just sort of made sense, even just pragmatically, it made sense to have Ephesus as sort of the starting point for a lot of these, these other church plants. Uh, after all, Ephesus was a city of about 250,000 people. Uh, it's a big city in, in those days. Uh, so it's, it's sort of functions as the launching point for a lot of these other church plants and a lot of, uh, of strengthening of these churches in the area. Uh, and it was, it was sort of the major, major port city in Asia Minor. So uh, being a port city and, and being the intersection of all these places, it's, it's a major trade city, right? And with a major trade city, you've got all these people, all this hustle and bustle of people coming through, all this, this industry. And we could say, you know, arguably, it's kind of the major city uh, in Asia Maya with just all these connections with these other important cities. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> another important thing is that Ephesus was famous in the region for their worship of Artemis. The goddess of anybody now? Also called Diana. The hunt was one. Uh, the goddess of fertility was probably the, the most significant one. Uh, so you see there uh, on the left a picture of what the temple to Artemis would have looked like. And I, I don't know if you can see Artemis is inside here. Um, 
and they were super proud of their Artemis worship. Uh, her, her temple was four times the size of the Parthenon. Huge temple. Uh, and if the casket empty book is right, I have no reason to believe it's not. It was 425 feet long, 60 feet high, 127 columns. You may remember it was one of the seven wonders of the world, of the ancient world. And so people traveled to and from Ephesus like crazy visiting this. Uh, maybe visiting the ruins of this. There's some debate as to whether this was standing at the time. We don't know. But one way or another, you sort of have to imagine all of this, this, this trading, this, like I said, hustle and bustle and, and selling shrines and images of Artemis. And, you know, there, there's just a ton of industry surrounding Artemis and surrounding the worship and, and the craftsmen making things for it. Um, come back to that. Uh, they also came from all over the world visiting uh, what you see on the left there, which is this massive amphitheater, about 50,000 people capacity. Uh, and this is where, by the way, what happened? Paul's dragged. What do, what do people say? Paul sort of cuts into their Artemis worship. People are becoming Christians, and uh, it cuts into their trade and to their profits. And so what do they do? They drag them there, and they scream, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so he experiences this, this persecution there. Um, and... Uh, you know, because because again, Paul's preaching over the course of time is is cutting into their profits. So anyway, uh, just just all this mixing and mingling of different cultures, sharing different ideas from all over the globe. <clears throat> there were tons of strategic opportunities to share the gospel uh, among the nations. Oops. Um, but, but think about this. And I, and I think this is actually more important than sort of the strategic nature, the pragmatic nature of Ephesus, it is that Paul preached there, and he made disciples there for three years. Three years. Uh, on, on his second uh, or third trip there as well, uh, but, but particularly his third trip, this is not what we think of when, or at least not what I oftentimes think of when we think of sharing the gospel, right? When we think of, marrying, uh, of, of making disciples, I think we tend, right? When we think of, of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we tend to think, okay, we, we make disciples by some sort of 10-minute gospel presentation, uh, or maybe we think that Paul stayed there for, you know, maybe stayed there for a few weeks, stayed there overnight, and all of a sudden, poof, you know, the Holy Spirit uses the preaching, and people become Christians, and uh, the church is planted, and, and, and all this happens. You know, maybe he just sort of came in and out, but, but that's not the picture, certainly not the picture of, of Ephesus, and it's really not the picture of, <clears throat> of almost anywhere in the book of Acts. Right? Remember when we see these sermons, even Peter's sermon, that seems like a really brief sermon, they're, they're condensed sermons. They're summaries of what happens. They're not sort of the whole picture, right? And, and even here, <laughs> we, like I read this and I read uh, that it's just two chapters in, in Acts 19 and, and 20. And I kind of go, oh, this, you know, just, we're moving along. Paul's just, you know, zipping through. The Holy Spirit's doing this, this crazy quick work. But disciple making is typically a much, much longer process. And uh, here's just one example of that. Paul gave daily lectures in the house of, uh, in the hall of Tyrannus. We learned that in Acts 19. And I, and I thought this was, this was really interesting to me as I was reading is that, that one of the early Greek manuscripts of, of Acts 19 recorded that the daily hours of instruction for Paul were 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily. 
11 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily is during, right? That's during the peak of the day. That's during the most traffic time where, where people uh, are getting the most hearers. And so you know, if, if the casket empty thing book got the, the math right, they said it's over 3,000 hours of instruction. A lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of, of relationship building over the course of those three years. Plus, you have to think about all the other things he was doing, right? That's not all he was doing was teaching in the House of Trias. He's visiting from house to house. He's, he's, he's forming all of these relationships. And then uh, after three years of making disciples in Ephesus and enduring all the persecution that was there, <clears throat> he traveled on to some of these other cities we saw earlier on his way to Corinth. But again, uh, and I don't, I don't want to harp too much on this, but again, this was a five-year process overall. This wasn't in and out of these places. This was Paul pouring his life into the lives of these other people, which, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, this makes sense of Paul writing these greetings in a lot of his letters. Because in part, he just, he just misses these people that he'd formed these relationships with over time. Uh, and he, you know, so like when he sends for Ephesus, he knows he can't go back uh, when he's going a different place. He can't go back through Ephesus, but he sends for the elders because he wants to see them. And they weep together, knowing that they're probably not going to see each other again. Or, you know, he, in, in the book of Philippians, he records how he's, He's rejoicing uh, uh, this, this back and forth visiting of, of Timothy and, and other people carrying letters from Philippi. Or in Corinth, in Galatia, he gets bad reports. So he's, he's sad. He, he's angry with the righteous anger, seemingly. Paul has this, just this broad range of emotions as he's corresponding with these various churches, as, as he's, you know, He's built these relationships because this is, these are just real disciple-making relationships. The, the kind of relationships I think Jesus intended when he said in Matthew 18 that I want you to go and make disciples. How are you going to make disciples? By teaching them all that the Lord has commanded. That's a lot of time. That's not a quick five-minute presentation. It's a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of energy, a lot of teaching. Um, and this is why Paul can say to the elders in Ephesus, <clears throat> I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching publicly and from house to house. And then later he says, I declare to you the whole counsel of God. So he, he's talking them through the scriptures in a way that's far deeper than what we are accustomed to, right? We're, we're trying to do that to some degree in our Sundays at 9 classes. They did it daily, right? They're, they're uh, spurring each other on on a daily basis, learning the scriptures, learning to, to love one another. And so part of <clears throat> what I want you to discuss, uh, if we get there, hopefully I can speed through some of this, uh, is uh, what about Paul's missionary journeys is instructive for us when we think about making disciples or we think about church planning. Take that for what it's worth. All right. Um, also on his third missionary journey from Ephesus, he writes First and Second Corinthians. Right? He's, he's corresponding back and forth with these couriers. And he, so he writes to follow up from his first visit. And he addresses some of their questions and some of their problems. Probably remember what some of them were. Uh, they had divisions among them. I follow Paul, I follow Paulus. They had sexual morality. They had debates or questions about uh, various false teaching or food sacrificed to idols. They're, they're questioning Paul's authority. They're, they're questioning the, real, the reality of the resurrection. And so Paul addresses some of these problems. He addresses some of uh, these, these questions and one of the things that probably is the most encouraging to me as I think about how Paul related to Ephesus and uh, Galatia and, and, and Corinth in particular, he's, he doesn't give up on them. I, <laughs> I think I would have written them off 
Instead, he's just this father figure to them. He tells them about all the things that he's, he's going through in, in 1 Corinthians, all these, I mean, these travels and the shipwrecks and all this stuff. But, but he, he kind of seems to imply that the, the biggest, hardest thing for him is his daily anxiety for the churches, his, his worry and his concern in a godly way for uh, Corinth and these other churches. And he also sends Timothy and Titus to, to remind them of what they had learned from him on his first visit. And he tells them about the reality of the resurrection as the first as a first importance, right? He cares deeply about their souls. He cares deeply about them as, as people. And so finally, he's able to come to them in person again. And once he gets the, gets there, he's he's actually refreshed to see that his admonitions had had taken root, his letters had, had taken root and, and producing fruit in Corinthians. So he Continues looking forward from there. He stays there just three months, but he continues looking forward uh, even more broadly to what he had already been doing, which is going towards the ends of the earth. And, and that's what the beginning of Acts was all about, right? Preaching from Jerusalem to Judea and to the ends of the earth. And as he's, as he's doing this, he's beginning to realize, oh, <laughs> Jesus is fulfilling his promises. So let's Press on. Uh, he's in Corinth there, and then he says that his purpose is to go to Jerusalem with another goal in mind. What was that other goal? You can cheat. He wants to go to Rome. So Acts 19.21 there. After I have been there, and the there is, is talking about Jerusalem. After I've been to Jerusalem, I must also see Rome. And from Rome, he actually wants to go to farther west, to, to Spain, to right ends of, ends of the earth there. Um, and so, but, but while he's there, he, he hears about this thriving community in Rome that's already, uh, already existing. And he hears this, you know, it's a, it's a good report. So he sends this woman named Phoebe to deliver a letter to them. And you can probably guess what letter that is. Rhymes with Romans, uh, right? The book of Romans. And what's the book of Romans all about? Uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to spend too much time on this, but um, it is, it, it's really significant, I think, that the book of Romans is Paul's most systematic book. That's why I think in part it's so beloved by the church today, because it's, it's sort of the most generic book, right? He's not addressing some problems in Corinth or some problems in Galatia, he is, he's, he's systematizing it. He's, he's, he's laying down the gospel, which through his experiences, he's preaching to all these churches. He's, he's seeing what the church needs to hear, which is essentially this. Uh, Romans 1, all Jews, all Gentiles, rather, are sinners and need Jesus because they can't keep the law. Romans 2, all Jews are sinners and they need Jesus because they can't keep the law. Romans 3, he summarizes, all of us can't keep the law. And so we need Jesus. We, we, we can't obey him enough to win his favor. Um, Jew and Gentile alike, there is no hope. The wrath of God is upon us, but God was going to justify his, his people in a way that doesn't have to do with our obedience to the law, it has to do with Jesus' obedience to the law for us despite our sin. And so look at, at Romans 3, 22 there. He says, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. <clears throat> um, J.I. Packer, one of, his, one of my favorite books, uh, Knowing God, he's, he's asked the question or he's posing the question, if you had to boil down the gospel to three words, what would it be? And he says, adoption through propitiation. And I actually think he's right, because Paul gets to adoption in chapter 8. And he says, Packer says, you know, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. 
Because adoption is, is that intimacy with God the Father. It's the highest privilege, but it's not the most fundamental privilege. The most fundamental privilege is justification, because you have to be right with God the judge before you can have this intimate relationship with God the Father. And so here in chapter 3, Paul is presenting sort of the central message of, uh, of Romans, uh, or at least of this part of Romans, as justification through propitiation. Uh, justification, Martin Luther said, is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. I think Luther was right about that. <clears throat> and so we have to ask the question, okay, what is justification in relation to propitiation? Because sometimes I think we throw out these words, uh, justification, sanctification, propitiation, redemption. Uh, we don't kind of get a, a sense of how they're distinguished and what they actually mean. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations. Some of the youth, especially the guys who have been to my boys' Bible study, you've seen these illustrations before, but uh, I think they're great uh, for, for understanding what justification is. So <clears throat> think of justification as, you, you've probably heard the phrase, just as if I never sinned. And then there's a second part that's, that's even more important than that, just as if I'd never sinned and been credited with the righteousness of Christ, right? So we don't get a blank slate. Uh, you know, it's not like anyone is going to be saved simply through the forgiveness of sins, right? It is just as if I'd never sinned, but it's, and I've been credited with the righteousness of Christ. So think about it this way. Um, this book, a good old Puritan book uh, called The Evil of Evils, this book represents a record of everything that we've done in our lives. Everything is tainted with sin. This book represents everything that Jesus has done in his life. And so when Jesus went to the cross, essentially what he did is he said to the Father, treat me as if everything uh, that they've done is what I've done. And the Father pours out his wrath. That's propitiation. But then he, the, he does something more, so to speak. He, he says, now I want you to treat them as if everything I've done, they've done. He credits us with his righteousness. It's as if in the mind of God, no, it's a reality in the mind of God that because we're, we're united to Jesus, we have faith in Jesus, we are credited with his righteousness. We are credited as if, as if we are the ones who loved people perfectly, who had perfect compassion. As if we can go this far, as to say that we are the ones who fed the 5,000. We are the ones who healed the lepers. We are the ones who've done everything that Jesus has done. We're credited with that kind of righteousness, right? So it's just as if I've never sinned and been credited with Christ's righteousness. That's justification. Now here's propitiation. <clears throat> this is us. It's an egg. No yolk in it. Don't worry. Uh, I drained it. Um, this is us in our sin. This is the wrath of God. If the wrath of God comes upon us because we've all disobeyed, we cannot keep the law, we would be crushed, right? That's, we all deserve eternity in hell. And yet what happens is for those who are in Christ, fasten it here, the wrath of God still comes down. Propitiation is a wrath-removing sacrifice. The wrath of God comes down. Jesus is crushed. He removes the wrath so that what is left for us is love. Even if that love takes the form of discipline uh, or, or righteous anger, it is, it's still love. He, he loves his children. There is no more wrath for uh, believers in Christ. So that's the, that's, that's the, the fundamental uh, message of uh, the book of Re Romans, that's, that's sort of, the, the, we could say the core of the gospel. And I can't resist talking about Romans 7 along the way because, because Paul sort of continues to talk about justification, and mother, and among other things. But then he, he gets to his own life in Romans 7. <laughs> it's just this wonderful picture. It's actually, I think, an illustration of justification. Because Paul, Paul had, he'd, previously talked about his, his old life uh, where he'd become a Christian 
and he uses the past tense, and then he switches over to the present tense toward the end of Romans 7, and he talks about his, his new life in Christ, but he says that it is, it is sort of on the regular, this continual struggle. He says, I keep doing the things that I don't want to do. He says, every time I, I uh, want to do good, evil is right there with him. That's his present experience of his, at this point, mature Christian life. And so there's this struggle with sin. And then look there at verse 24, description of his life. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then he summarizes, I myself serve the law of God in my mind. This is what I want. Right? I'm a lover of God's law, but with my flesh, I serve right, the remnants of sin. I serve the law of sin. That's the, that's the state he's in. He's this continual struggle with sin. My favorite verse in the Bible is the next verse, chapter 8. There is therefore now, in the midst of these sinful, guilty circumstances that he's still struggling with sin, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? For those who are in Christ Jesus, the wrath has already come. The, the, the condemnation has already come. And so there's, there's, no, more, uh, there's no more wrath. And it's just, it's just this wonderful... Uh, picture of the gospel. All right, so let's go back to Paul's journey to Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm going to really need to speed through this now because I want to I wanna leave time for questions. But, but Paul leaves from Corinth to, toward Jerusalem. And, and part of what I love about this account is, <clears throat> is he's, he's gathered all these believers from all these different places, from all his missionary journeys, uh, from just all these diverse backgrounds, right? And their names are recorded in Acts 20, verse 4. I just want to read some of these names and some of the places they're from to, to give us an idea of, of the diversity there. Uh, Sopater is from Berea, where Paul had visited and preached the gospel. He'd become a Christian. Aristarchus and Secundus are from Thessalonica. Gaius is from Derby. It's near Galatia. Uh, so it seems like he's, uh, seems like all these are Gentiles. Then Timothy is a Jew from Lystra. Tychicus and Trophimus are from Ephesus. And then there's Luke, right, who is writing the letter. Luke uh, was a physician from Antioch, also most likely a Gentile. So there's all these men of all these diverse backgrounds. Uh, mostly Gentiles, but it's a mix of Jews, and they go to Jerusalem to, to give this offering as united brothers in Christ. There's, there's all these distinctions, seemingly all these distinctions between Jew and Gentile, but they come to Jerusalem as sort of this visible evidence, this visible fruit of Paul's labor among the Gentiles. And, and this is, again, this is the message Paul had been preaching, that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We're all sinners. We all need the gospel. And so we're all one <clears throat> by faith in Jesus. But that does not mean things were easy. Uh, Paul is, when he comes there in, in uh, Acts 20, he's received gladly by the church in Jerusalem. And they praise God that Gentiles are incorporated into the covenant community. But... He's in the broader culture. He's arrested in the temple because he's falsely accused of defiling the temple primarily. It's the main accusation. Uh, uh, accused of defiling the temple during Pentecost of all places. But Paul's a citizen of what? Where? Rhymes with Shmoman. He's a Roman citizen. Uh, and so he asks permission to speak to the crowds. He's given permission, and he testifies to these Pentecost pilgrims. Uh, people, again, coming from all over the place to celebrate these, these 50 days of, of feasts. Again, another opportunity to share the gospel and to share the story of how Jesus worked in his life. 
He also testifies about Jesus before the Jewish Sanhedrin, made up of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You ever heard the phrase the Sadducees or Sadducee? Because they don't believe in what? The resurrection. And the Pharisees aren't fair, you see, because they were legalistic. Uh, and so the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin just, they go to war, right? Paul mentions the resurrection and they go ballistic on each other. And there's this, you know, this big hullabaloo. Um, Paul's <clears throat> saved from that. So then he also... Uh, testifies before the Roman proxy ruler Felix. And just a short way to summarize a bunch of stuff, uh, eventually he goes to Festus and to Agrippa, and Paul answers the false charges that are, that are there. But I love this. He does not get distracted. Like, if I was there, I would do nothing but defend myself. Paul, Paul that's not Paul's primary concern. He does defend himself. But he doesn't get distracted from this central issue that, that God has come to save both Jew and Gentile through the resurrection of the dead, right? He's here in chains because of his speaking of the resurrection of the dead. That, that, that is the only way of salvation. And that wasn't particularly popular then. It wasn't, it's not particularly popular now. But, but that's the heart of the gospel. And that's... Uh, that's actually what eventually gets him put in prison in Caesarea once he gets there. And even in Caesarea, he's emphatic that he's preaching about the resurrection because of the hope of Israel. In other words, he, he presents the gospel as the fulfillment of all the promises made to Israel. All the way back, you know, what we've been talking about, all the way back to, to the book of Genesis, where God makes the, the promise to Abraham that, uh, that if Abraham believes and does believe he is justified. He is credited, it was credited to him uh, as righteousness. And, uh, and, and through Abraham, all of the nations were to be blessed. All of the nations were who, all the people of the nations who were to believe in the God of Abraham would also be credited with the, the righteousness of Christ that was, was promised. So Paul's insisting that all of these promises to Israel are fulfilled in, in Jesus. Jesus as the hope of, of Israel and the hope of the Gentiles. But then from prison in Caesarea, he begins his journey and his witness to Rome. And God preserves his life through a series of ordeals there on his way, he goes on this long journey, ends up shipwrecked in, uh, in Malta, just this miraculous story we don't have time to get into, but from Malta, he reaches the coast of Italy, he eventually gets to Rome, but it's this, this long process of this sort of judicial process in which he continues to appeal to his Roman citizenship, so he appeals to, to Caesar, he could, if he hadn't appealed, uh, Agrippa, I think it was, said that he could, uh, he could have been released, but he's in chains. Goes to Rome. He's in chains. He's literally chained to Roman soldiers. Now think about that. Under house arrest, chained to Roman soldiers. What do you think Paul's talking about as these Roman soldiers can't get away from him? They're, they're in shift, shifts uh, chained to Paul. Paul's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the hope of Israel. He's talking about the hope of Gentiles being in, in Jesus. So he says in his epistles that, that at that time, even though he's, uh, he's in chains in, uh, in Rome, even though he's bound, he says in his epistles that the word of God is not bound. Second Timothy. The word, he's bound. The word of God is not bound because he's free to preach the gospel. Uh, and others are free to preach the gospel, even if their uh, motives are not so good. So he rejoices in that. And then it's during this time of imprisonment that Paul writes many of his letters. Uh, it's debated which ones necessarily, but it's explicitly stated in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon that uh, Paul is in chains for the gospel. So these are the letters that are called the prison epistles. And according to the early church, at least, he's eventually released to head out for further ministry in Spain. 
uh, but then supposedly imprisoned a second time in Rome. I don't have reason to doubt that. And that's when we think the pastoral epistles were written to Timothy and Titus, where Paul teaches these leaders of the churches to, to be godly examples and he exhorts them to, to preach the same gospel, the same central message that he'd been preaching throughout, throughout Acts, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead as the offspring of David. Again, the fulfillment of the promises to Israel incorporating Jew and Gentile into the covenant community uh, toward the end of the earth. And then I love... I, love, I heard this in seminary for the first time, and it just blew my mind. The end of the book of Acts it ends on this, this just super optimistic note with the, the proclamation of the gospel going forward unhindered. Unhindered. So look there. Uh, he, talking about Paul, he lived there. That's talking about the, the house arrest in Rome. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. Apparently, a lot of people came to him. And during that, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness. Final word, unhindered. It's one Greek word. Uh, I changed it a little bit here. Um, That's how the book of Acts ends unhindered. And you get this sense with this abrupt ending, you get the sense that the story is not over, right? It doesn't say anything about him eventually going to Spain. It doesn't say anything about about all the things maybe we would have wished he would have sort of wrapped things up uh, about how it's going on to the ends of the earth. Um, You get the sense that the story is not over. And I think that's exactly what, uh, what is intended. In fact, there's this whole movement now with a uh, a gospel network called the called Acts 29 network, in which you know there's only 28 chapters in Acts, and they're calling themselves Acts 29, the the fulfillment, right, the the continuation of of the book of Acts. And I think they're onto something. They're not the only ones who've who've noticed this. And, and the idea is that we are the continuation of the story of Acts that the gospel is going to continue to advance and eventually people from every tribe and language and people and nation are going to be worshiping around the throne because Jesus promises right from the beginning that I will be with you in Acts 20, Acts 20, uh, excuse me, uh, Matthew 28. And he promises right from the beginning of Acts that it will go from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria into the ends of the earth. Uh, he always fulfills his promises to his people. And so that's what's going to happen. All right. That said, I want to give you some time <clears throat> for, for discussion. You see the questions there. Uh, first one's really simple. What stood out to you from today's lesson? And if you just want to discuss that and you get no further, that's fine. Or there's a couple, a few other questions. Uh, what lessons can we learn from Paul's long stay in Ephesus? How is his approach to discipleship and church planning instructive for us today? Uh, Number three, why is Paul's life in Romans 7 such a good illustration of justification, particularly as it relates to Romans 8? Um, Similarly, how does the, quote, there is no condemnation message of Romans 8, 1 relate to how we live for Jesus, right? Does it it mean that we just, you know, live however we want now Uh, or, or, How do we live in light of the gospel rather than in in trying to earn God's favor? And then four, uh, how should the ending of the book of Acts increase our confidence in fulfilling the Great Commission? All right. Uh, Not a ton of us, but it looks like we can do two groups maybe, one here and one here-ish. And you can talk about that for 10 minutes or so. Right. Yeah, the comment uh, that we... That the gospel is unhindered, and yet we don't always have that confidence that God's going to fulfill his promises, both, both on an individual level and a corporate level. His whole church uh, is, is doing that. And we can praise God that that's going to happen, and there would be people from every tribe and language and people and nation. Uh, and yet it doesn't feel that way. How could he use 
little old Steve Lammers in my little one, one niche of his kingdom. Yeah, good. Other thoughts? Things that stuck out? Stuck out? Can't say stuck out. Stuck out? Things your group talked about? He who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of Christ, to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, speak, and that's, that's the you there is plural, right? Both, he's going to work in your life and he's going to work in the life of the church to build, you know, I will build my kingdom in the gates of hell. Will I will build my church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, and there was there was a point where he actually skipped over Ephesus. He called the 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 elders of the church in Ephesus because he wanted to see him last time and give him one more exhortation. But he actually skipped over Ephesus because he wanted to get quickly to Corinth uh, because he needed he needed to follow up with some stuff there and he needed to to get to Jerusalem so they could get on farther to Rome. So uh, this wasn't this wasn't the whole picture, but. And the reason I mention that is because I just I see Acts as like this series of of like gospel presentations as opposed to long standing relationships. Um, so in one way or another, good comment. All right, let me let me pray. Father, we thank you that uh, the, it is true that the gospel will go forward unhindered. We may not see the fruit of that in our little places and tribes. Uh, we may, uh, may not, uh, will not see every person come to faith in Christ. And yet uh, you promise that uh, people from all nations, all people groups will, uh, as a remnant at least, come to trust in you. So we long for that day. We long for that day where we will worship around the throne with, with people from every ethnicity, every language, every culture, 
uh, just worshiping you. Oh, Lord, come, Jesus, we pray. Amen.